Well, hello, brothers and sisters. What a wonderful time to be able to come together and turn our focus from the world into the Word of God. That's where we get our strength from. It's where our very life blood comes from. And so it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. And I remind you again, morning's on the way. The fullness of morning and all of the promises that God has in store for us. But in the meantime, we have an obligation and a responsibility to stay connected to God, to bring him glory in order to make sure that our lives are pleasing to him and that he can use us. And so once again today, we're going back to John chapter 15, dealing with abiders or survivors. Which one are we? Now we've spent several weeks on this and we're going to continue to look at it. And it's very important that we grasp what Jesus is saying here. And so, I want to read one verse in particular tonight because that's what I'm going to be dealing with. And it is the very first verse of John. I am the true vine. And we've looked at that. And I'll talk about it again tonight. And my father is the vine dresser. Now, we've read that statement, but we've not looked into it. What does that mean? I want to begin by, once again, reminding us that Israel was thought of in terms of a vine. It was a very clear image for them. In fact, listen to what Isaiah said. He said, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the gardens of his delight. And so the grapevine became a symbol of national life, and that emblem appeared on coins during the Maccabean period. And so precious was this symbol to the Jews that a huge gold grapevine decorated with uh, jewels of all kinds uh, were above the gates of the temple. Listen to what someone said. In the temple at Jerusalem, above and round the gates, 70 cubits, that's over 100 feet tall, a richly carved vine was extended as a border and decoration. The branches, tendrils, and leaves were of the finest gold. The stalks of the branches were of the length of the human form. Can you imagine that? And the bunches hanging upon them were of costly jewels. Herod first placed it there, and then rich and patriotic Jews from time to time added to its embellishment. One contributed a new grape, another would put in a leaf, a third would uh, place a precious jewel as a bunch of grapes there, or one of the grapes. This vine had an extremely uncommon importance for the Jews, and a very sacred meaning to them because it showed their ownership to whom it belonged. It belonged to God. And they understood that they were the vine. And what majestic splendor it must have been to have viewed this in the moonlight. And perhaps that's exactly what Jesus did when he came out of the upper room that night. When he began to head out of the upper room where he had just celebrated uh, the Lord's Supper, instituted a brand new covenant, and said it is going to be put in effect by my blood. When he instituted that, and then as he came with the disciples down on ground level, and as they walked through the gates of that temple, and he left it for the last time, only to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it may have been lighted by the moonlight there. It may have been that which flickered off of the lights that were burning in the Kidron Valley. It may have been illuminated uh, very simply or brought to focus by a grapevine that fell across our Lord's face as he walked through it. I don't know. But the last expectation the disciples had, surely, was for him, if they had known this was his last words to them, it would have been something very unexpected for them to expect a lecture and a teaching on the grapevine, to expect such kind of dis discourse. But again, perhaps it was triggered by the glow of that vine over the temple door uh, there on the temple mount as they walked out of that door. Uh, but Jesus headed to, toward Gethsemane that night, spoke to them about the grapevine. And he said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, and you are the branches. And Jesus chose his words extremely carefully and very simply. 
in order that they might understand the truth of what he is saying. One, who he is. Two, who they are. And three, who the Father is. Now, I want to back up and maybe put this in an outline form. And we've already, already talked about two of these points. I'm going to focus tonight on the third point, and then we're going to come back and talk some more about each one of these later on. But Jesus taught the clear, very clearly, the ABCs of fruit bearing. And the teaching, this is something that we need to pay attention to. His teaching was so clear, so sharp, so precise, until all conversation ends, the disciples knew that they were hearing something that just took their breath away. And do you realize that this is the only chapter in the Gospel of John where there is no conversation? Never once did they interrupt Jesus. They had done that many, many times before. Never once did they question him because it was so plain and obvious to them. What he was saying was so pointed, again, until even a little child could understand it. And this is the final I am saying of Jesus when he said, I am the true vine. And so the disciples listen in silence as Jesus talks about the ABC of fruit bearing. Now, first of all, I want to deal tonight with, we've already talked about, we have to believe that Jesus is the true vine. That's the B of fruit bearing. The third thing is C. We have to connect ourselves as branches and stay connected as the branch abides in the trunk because that's where our life source comes from. That's how the full Holy Spirit flows through our life. And any fruit that is born is done by the Holy Spirit. But tonight I want to talk for a little bit. Let's gather our thoughts and see exactly what <coughs> Jesus is saying when he said, I am the true vine and my father is who? He is the vine dresser. Well, the first thing I'd point out is that means God is the owner. He's the owner of the vineyard. He's the owner of everything that the vineyard produces. And God is the cultivator of that vineyard. And God is the tiller of that vineyard. And God is the pruner of that vineyard. And so we're going to look at tonight God being the vine dresser. Now, the vine dresser is the owner. The sole interest of the owner of the vineyard is what? The sole interest, the sole point of the owner is to produce fruit in his vineyard. And that's why Jesus talks about fruit. So whatever it takes for fruit to be produced is what God is going to do because he is the vine dresser. Do you remember the parable in the Bible? And we've referred to it before where the man, the owner of the vineyard came and he found that his vineyard was bearing no grapes. The vine uh, just was not fruit bearing. And the owner said, dig it up, dig it up. Why? Because the whole point of the vine is to produce fruit in his vineyard of the vine dresser. And when that doesn't happen, then Jesus talked to us about that. He said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He takes away. I'll talk about that again tonight and again a little further on because it is important that we grasp the truth of that, what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is not saying. So whatever it takes for fruit to be produced in our lives, if we are connected to the true vine, it is for us to produce fruit. Now, the way that the vine dresser has fruit come on his vine, the way that he cultivates it is that he prunes the branches. Now that's extremely important. Anybody who's got a great vine or has ever been around one that has seen anything and knows anything about it knows that you have to prune the branches. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, who does God prune? Well, we have the answer. Look again in John chapter 15. Jesus, verse 1, said, I am the true vine, and my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. He takes away. The branch that bears no fruit is spoken of here in the first part of verse 2. The branch that
There's no fruit. Jesus said it is removed. It withers up. It dies. It's thrown into the fire. In other words, it is useless. It is useless. It doesn't mean that a branch connected to an apple tree that is pruned away, and it's pruned away because it has no fruit and bears no fruit, ceases to be an apple branch. But it does mean that it is removed. And so it is with the branch, the Christian who produces no fruit in their lives. And we talked about that. That is the diseased branch, if you will, the carnal Christian. Now, Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. And there's a severe consequence for that. And that's what Jesus was talking about, the vine dresser pruning the branch, removing it. Listen to what he said to the Corinthian church, a very carnal church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we overlook this too much. But it's true for the church, an appointed word to the church. Every church down through all of the ages, every branch, every Christian down through the ages. In verse 30, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. And do you know what? That means when we're convicted and God is saying, listen, you're not who I desire for you to be as a branch. You're not bearing fruit. And the reason is because you're not connected to me and you refuse to be connected to me. And guess what? He disciplines us for that. And he removes that branch if necessary. He removes that branch. Now, the branch that bears no fruit, but look again, if you will, at the branch that bears some fruit in the last part of this verse. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And, or but, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. In other words, even a fruit-bearing branch is pruned by the vine dresser. Why? Why? So that it may bear more fruit. So that it may bear more fruit. And then look in verse 5. No branch is exempt. That's what Jesus is saying from the vine dresser pruning it. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Jesus talks about uh, that fruit or that vine that is bearing fruit, that he prunes it too where it is necessary in order that it might bear more fruit. Now, why? Because that is what glorifies God. Now, stop and think about it. The fruit that is born in the gardener does what? It glorifies, or in the garden, does what? It glorifies the gardener because that's who it points to. It didn't come from nowhere. It didn't produce fruit on its own. It points to the one who cultivated that, who plowed it, who tilled it, and who pruned it in order that it might bear fruit. Why? Because it is that, Jesus says, that glorifies my Father. The more fruit, the more God is glorified. The more fruit, the more God is glorified. Do you see what it's saying here? Jesus is saying there's not a one of the branches. Excuse me. Jesus said there's not a one of the branches that the vine dresser does not prune. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that we ought to be filled with joy like James talks about and Peter talks about through trials and tribulations. We ought to be thrilled because it is proof that we are a true branch. And God is going to do what it takes to bring glory to himself through the branch as we bear fruit. Now, Proverbs 3.12, what does it say? It says, for the one God loves, he does what? He disciplines, he corrects. That's exactly what the book of Hebrews says too. For the one God loves, he disciplines, he corrects, he prunes. Who does he do that to? To the one that he loves. Who does he love? 
He loves every branch that is in him. Pruning is not pleasant. Let me just tell you that. And there are some people who have never discovered this. Life's going along fine. They think they're okay. In fact, they think that all the blessings that they have in life are because they're so righteous with God. But the truth of the matter, there's not a branch that belongs to him that does not need pruning. And I'm going to tell you, when pruning takes place, it is not pleasant, but it is productive. It's not pleasant, but it is productive. And when we come to John 15, Jesus is clearly teaching that pruning is that which we can always expect, and it's always good for us, and in the end, it's to bring glory to God. Now, the branch can be stubborn, and the branch can refuse to bear fruit anyway. Now, the natural branch may not be able to do that, but we as branches in Christ, uh, we're able to do that. We can resist him, resist him. But guess what? When we do, it's just like Paul said. We wither up and die on, and are discarded and put on the shelf like a castaway. And there's no joy in our life. There's no sap flowing in our lives. Life becomes just dead at best. Listen to what Malcolm Muggeridge said. He said, suppose you eliminated suffering. What a dreadful place the world would be. Now think about that. What kind of statement is that? If all suffering was gone, what a dreadful place the world would be. And you say, well, I don't agree with that. But let him go on and let him speak. He said, I would uh, rather eliminate happiness. The world would be a most ghastly place because everything that corrects the tendency of this unspeakable little sinful creature called man, everything that corrects him would be gone. And man would feel over-important and over-pleased with himself. He's bad enough now, but he would be absolutely intolerable if he never suffered. And that's true for us. Pride goes before fall, and pride always goes before Jesus removing the branch, not as a lost person, but as a carnal Christian. He will remove the branch if we will not accept the pruning that he brings in our lives. And you know what? When the vine dresser begins to prune us, do you know what we say? When difficult circumstances come into our lives and when suffering comes into our lives, we cry. We cry out, oh, not the knife, not the knife. Take the knife away. Get it out of my life. But Jesus said that the vine dresser prunes all of his branches anyway. Anyway. Why? Because he desires fruit. We need to remember, we must remember that the one who proves us, the one who prunes us has proven his love for us. And whenever he takes the branch in his hand, he's doing it with loving tenderness, care and compassion with an eye to the future and the purpose that he has. We can't see the purpose and we don't like to be feel, uh, being squeezed in his hand and we certainly don't like the scissors or the knife. But we can cry all we want. God, in his grace, mercy, love, and care for us, and in his purpose for us, which is always eternally better than anything that we desire, we don't even know it yet, he's going to prune us anyway. How do I know that? I remember the words in Jeremiah. Remember Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And he said to the nation of Israel, whom he stood before day after day for years and years and said, God's going to judge you. But he also said to the same nation, he has loved you with an everlasting love. And so he has us. That's why Jeremiah was able to say again, my favorite verse in the Old Testament, one of those for I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord, the vine dresser. Plans for welfare, 
and not for calamity, for a future and a hope. So we know who God prunes. The Bible tells us, Jesus tells us right here, it's plain as day. Every branch that is in him, every branch, every Christian, every believer that is in Jesus as the vine, connected by his blood, connected by his grace, through faith, he prunes him. He prunes you. He prunes me. He prunes all of us. And some of us, if we're not careful, we'll believe, well, I'm beyond that. I, I'm not a child anymore. I don't need discipline. Uh, God's just proud of who I am. Pride goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. Now, look in verse 8, if you will, of John 15. Jesus said, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So we know why God prunes. God prunes for fruitfulness in our lives. And that fruitfulness comes from faithfulness that hinges upon us as we allow the Holy Spirit to have control of our lives. That's the only reason we're fruitful. Not because we made a profession of faith, but because we're faithful and we are abiding, abiding, abiding in the trunk where the source of all of our life comes from and the only hope for fruitfulness comes from. And so we have to ask, our question, ask the question now, we know who God prunes, but how does he prune us? How does he prune us? Well, the first thing I would point out is he prunes us by the power of his providence. That's why some things come into our lives we don't understand. It's not just happenstance. God just didn't take a nap for a while and it kind of crept in. No, by the power of his providence. What a wonderful story. What a wonderful the story of, G of Joseph gives us in the Old Testament. Stop and think about him as a young man, so hated by his brothers until they dug a pit and threw him in it and planned to kill him. But what did they do? Instead, they sold him to slave traders, Midianites, who carried him to Egypt. And there, there, he served as a slave. There, he was put in prison. There, he was mistreated by Potiphar and falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And there he remained for a long time, years. We're not talking, well, a few bad days. We're talking years. Joseph underwent this and underwent this and underwent this. But the day came when Joseph's brothers, the same one that threw him into the pit, stood before him. And they didn't recognize him, but Joseph recognized them. But he also recognized something much more important than that. What is it that he said? He had grown so wise from his years of pridefulness as a youth and just talking about, oh, I had a dream where even my father, my brothers, and even you, Father, bowed down before me. That's pride. That's arrogance. But now he's at a point of time in his life where he has discovered something he has discovered that the providence of God has worked in his life. And he says to his brothers, as they broke down in fear before him, trembling, realizing what they, have, they had done, he said, now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God, but God. And so we don't need to blame what happens in our lives to others because overall, we opened the door and God allowed it to come to us and by his providence, he's trying to remove something from our lives as the vine dresser. And he does it by means of providence. Providence. Again, God is not a ho-hum, happenstance, well, whatever may be, may be, que sera, que sera, that's just your life. No, 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 no. Everything, we take it from the hand of God. And we recognize, Lord, I don't like this. And we cry out as the vine or as a branch. And we say, don't prune me. Don't cut me. And God says, I don't care what you want. That's the way it's going to be. 
it is the only way that I'll be able to accomplish my purpose, which is for you to bear more fruit and bring glory to me, glorify me. And so by the power of providence, God does that in our lives. And I'm not going to go into this. I'm going to move away for a few mo moments to have prayer to remind us of some things. But I want you to stay with us. And next week, we're going to look at another way. Not who. We've already decided that. It was decided by Jesus. And it was told to us in such a simple way. And there's no way around it. Every branch, every branch is pruned by the vine dresser. But I want us to look at some other ways that God prunes us because we reject those just as quickly as we do the providence of God. But there are powerful uh, pruners, if you will, in the hands of God. And so I'm going to close in prayer in a few moments. I want to remind you of what we do online. Take advantage of it. I believe with all my heart we're in dangerous days, not because of the uh, COVID virus, but because we've had a line drawn in the sand, a decision for us as branches. Those of, of us who uh, are in Christ and say we believe in him, there's a dividing line now because it's so easy. Because so many churches are closed, they're having to go online. Nobody knows if I'm watching. Nobody knows if I'm making my family sit down. Nobody knows if I'm reading my Bible daily. Nobody is in my Sunday school class talking to me about uh, asking questions. I don't have to. I don't have to do any of that. And it's easy to never show up. And the danger of it is, you begin to go weeks and then months, and then before you know it, when the doors of the church are open again. You won't be there because you have unhooked yourself, disconnected yourself from the vine by willfulness. And it is a dangerous place to put your family and to put you. Make no mistake, if you belong to God, if you belong to God, he'll bring providence to pass in your life in order to correct you and me. It doesn't matter. And so I encourage you, remember all of the activities that are present for you. We're having a great time on Sunday night as we study through the book of Ruth. What an amazing and wonderful, powerful, heart-changing, heartwarming book the book of Ruth is. So if you want to join us with that, it, certainly all you have to do is you'll find out when and how and take, take advantage of that as well as the Sunday school classes. We have teachers who are prepared every week. Every week they've been faithful to do the work. And it's more difficult to do it online than it is to sit in a class. It's much more difficult. If you don't think so, then our teachers would be glad to let you have a go at it this Sunday. Just let them know. Well, there are so many other things going on with our youth, and I appreciate Chuck and Christy as they Prepare for music and worship every Sunday morning. Avail yourself. Avail yourself of these opportunities. Now let's pray together. I know there are many prayer needs that we have. Some are expressed uh, on the prayer sheet, the prayer needs that uh, we all know about in the office. If you don't know, then you can call and find out. Just simply call and ask. Ask any of the staff. Ask Penny if you want to add something or if you can catch us up to date on something. But let's remember that we are to be in prayer for each other. Prayer, we have to be careful does it, that it doesn't come become just a perfunctory uh, action we're doing. Oh, time to pray, let me say a few words. No, we need to go to our God in prayer, praying for our brothers and sisters who are in need and praying for ourselves that God will keep us and that our heart will be warmed, be warmed. And I think again of what one of my favorite passages in the book of Luke is, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, not understanding the power of the risen Lord and what he said. And then as he walked with them and they walked with him, they could have walked away that day and they never would have known it, but they were able to experience the glow and the glory of a living God. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us? You know, and they're talking about as we listened to him, as we walked with him, 
as we worship. And that's exactly what happens if we'll humble ourselves before his word. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you, God, that you love us so much that like a mom or a dad and parents who will not let their children just get by with something. Lord, not take the easy way out. And God, you love us more than our parents ever could or we could ever love our children. Lord, you promised that you could prove us. And I thank you for that. And I pray, God, that the next time we feel squeezed by circumstances that we'll realize this is the hand of the vine dresser allowing this in my life and the cutting and the pruning is for her, his purposes. And Lord, that we'll submit and surrender. Now God, you know the needs that we have. And I'm glad that we don't have to mention them by name because God, you knew before they ever had the need and before we ever mentioned their name. And you're more than able abundantly above and beyond all that we ever think or ask to take care of these things. And I pray that you'll do it, Lord, in such a way and that our minds will be open until there's recognition of your loving hand of mercy and grace in our lives. And even though things aren't pleasant sometimes in our lives, that we will receive it with all joy, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience on and on and on until our faith is grown. And it is our faith, God, that you give us as we stay connected to you by your spirit that produces fruit in our lives. And we just are bearing branches, not producing branches. And I thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight.